Hi everyone. We are very happy to offer you an online walking tour of our neighborhood as related to the Salem Witchcraft Trials of 1692. Along the way, we will visit the site locations where the three Salem women who were executed in 1692 lived. We're going to start our tour on Salem Common across the street from our museum. First, I want to share a little history of our building. It was constructed between 1844 and 46 by American architect Menard Lefebvre. Known for his churches, several of which are in New York, Lefebvre wrote five pattern books which were influential in spreading the Gothic Revival style, which is what you see here. Our building was originally the second Unitarian church in Salem. There was a fire here in 1902, and then legend has it a lightning strike in 1925 damaged one of the bell towers, at which time the height of both towers were reduced. The congregation faded away around World War II, and the building sat empty until 1957, when the Salem Auto Museum and Americana Shops called this home for a decade. In 1969, another fire caused damage to the interior. Then, on May 6, 1972, Holly and Tom Mulvihill opened the Salem Witch Museum almost 50 years ago. Visitors to our museum will see a statue standing out front. This is Roger Conant, the founder of Salem. Conant arrived from England in 1624, first landing in Plymouth, moving to Gloucester, and finally arriving in Salem in 1626. Salem was incorporated in 1629. The name Salem, derived from the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, means city of peace. The statue by Henry Hudson Kitson was erected in 1913, almost 60 years before the Salem Witch Museum existed. And yet, because they are seen together, Conant is now often mistaken for a witch rather than a man in Puritan clothing. Our location has a direct connection to the witchcraft trials. In 1692, Reverend John Higginson, the 76-year-old minister of Salem, lived on this property with his second wife Mary, his daughter Anne Dolliver, and Anne's three children. His property encompassed the area covered by the museum and the buildings on each side. Higginson had been the minister of Salem since 1660 and was, by 1692, less active and so was assisted by 45-year-old Nicholas Noyes, who lived over on Townhouse Lane, which was also known as Court Street and is known as Washington Street today. Higginson first arrived in Salem in 1629 with his father, Francis, who was Salem's first minister. After attending Harvard, John Higginson ministered in Connecticut until 1659. On a sea voyage headed back to England that year, a storm forced Higginson's ship to land in Salem. Ultimately, he never left Salem and was minister of the first church here from 1660 until his death 48 years later. As we walk down Brown Street toward our next stop, I'm going to tell you more about the Higginson family in 1692. By that time, Reverend Higginson was more moderate in his views from some other Essex County ministers and limited his participation in the trials. Yet on June 6th, his daughter Anne was accused of witchcraft, arrested, jailed, and examined. Ten years earlier, Anne had married Gloucester fisherman William Dolliver, who abandoned her and their children, and so she returned to her father's, quote, crazed in her understanding, unquote, according to Reverend Higginson. When examined, she confessed to owning poppets, similar to voodoo dolls, a form of folk magic, and admitted she once stayed out all night in the woods. She was also accused of saying she wished for her father's death. Her strange behavior likely made her a target. She apparently suffered from depression for most of her life. She was not convicted and returned to live in Salem with her father and stepmother, with whom she apparently did not get along. As Higginson neared the end of his life, he arranged for a couple to take Anne in and care for her after he passed. They were Sarah and Edward Bishop, who themselves had been accused of witchcraft in 1692, and by the early 1700s they were living in Rehoboth, Mass, in the south of the state, on the border with Rhode Island. Higginson was 92 when he died in 1708. We are walking along the side of St. Peter's Church, which is our next stop. Here at the intersection of Brown Street and St. Peter Street is the first Anglican church built in Salem, founded around 1733, just over 100 years after Salem's founding. 
Of course, the early Puritans fled to the New World to get away from the Church of England. The original building was wooden. This stone structure was built in 1833, enlarged in 1845, and a chapel was added to the back in 1871 on top of the cemetery. At that time, the gravestones of those buried were moved to the front, as you see. The remains stayed in the ground. Among those buried here is Philip English. He was the wealthiest merchant in Salem and donated the land to build this church. He died in 1735. Philip English was from the Channel Island of Jersey. Channel Islands are off the coast of Normandy in the English Channel. And so his first language was French. He was Anglican, but he attended the Puritan Church. He was the wealthiest merchant in Salem and owned ships and wharves and warehouses. He was a town selectman who favored other Jersey men when collecting taxes and did not always pay his own. He was quick to sue for debts. These things made him different and many townspeople did not like him. Perhaps these reasons were why both he and his wife Mary were accused of witchcraft. Their wealth initially meant they could rent a room in the Boston jailkeeper's home rather than staying in Boston jail. Then, with the support of two Boston ministers, Samuel Willard and Joshua Moody, they escaped and fled to New York to wait out the trials. English forfeited a 4,000 pound bond in doing so. We'll hear more about the Englishes later on our tour. You see the street is called St. Peter Street, but in the 17th century it was called Prison Lane. As we walk toward Federal Street, we'll approach the site of the 1692 jail. It stood at the corner of Prison Lane and County Street, which is today known as Federal Street. It is thought the jail was a two-story building with a common dungeon on the first floor, not necessarily underground. It was dirt floored and stunk of dung and tobacco. It was hot in summer and cold in winter. Prisoners were shackled to prevent their specters from flying around tormenting people. It was one of four prisons used in 1692 for a majority of the prisoners. The others were Boston, Cambridge, and Ipswich. Obviously, 150 people could not fit in one jail. All who were executed were eventually here, and it was from here that they would be taken to their hanging. Farther down on the building, there's a plaque to note the historic importance of this location. In a field nearby, possibly across from the jail or next to the jail, one of the most gruesome deaths occurred when Giles Corey was pressed under heavy stones on September 19th for refusing to allow his trial to move forward. It was thought the pressing would force the 81-year-old man to comply, but he did not. He died in a matter of hours. Legend says his only words were, more weight. In the 1950s, the New England Telephone Company excavated this area to build their 10 Federal Street building as you see it today, and uncovered three beams from the original jail. One is at the Peabody Essex Museum, one is at the Witch Dungeon Museum, and you will see one in our second exhibit at the Salem Witch Museum. In 1692, there were many taverns in Salem. Brothers Thomas and Samuel Beadle operated two of them. It's hard to imagine today, but at the head of Prison Lane in the 17th century, approximately where the Witch City Mall entrance is, was the location of Samuel Beadle's tavern. His brother's tavern is more frequently mentioned in the records of the witch trials, but this location figures into testimony regarding Alice Parker, hanged for witchcraft on September 22nd. Alice's seafaring husband, John, liked his drink and spent time at Samuel Beadle's tavern, too much time for Alice's liking. In her trial, John Westgate testified that one evening Alice barged into the tavern to scold her husband for staying too long. When Westgate tried to intervene and calm Alice down, he was told to mind his own business. Later that night, Westgate claimed the specter of a black pig followed him as he headed home. Due to his altercation with Alice earlier that night, he was sure she had sent the demonic being to torment him, or perhaps it was Alice herself. As we walk toward our next stop, I'm going to talk about Bridget Bishop. Although not the first to be accused, she was the first to be tried and executed in 1692. Bridget was born in England in the 1630s. She married Samuel Wasselby in 1660. They came to New England and her husband died on ship or shortly after arriving. We know this because she had a child in Boston and on the birth certificate it says father is deceased. 
that baby died, and it's believed an earlier child in England also died. By 1666, Bridget was in Salem, married to Thomas Oliver. The Olivers lived on Townhouse Lane, also known as Court Street, which is today Washington Street, which is up ahead, and their property extended back to the old Lyceum building and beyond. There were orchards approximately where Turner's Seafood is today. That's in the old Lyceum building. Together, the Olivers had one child, a daughter named Christian. Thomas Oliver had three children from his first marriage. Thomas died in 1679, and then Bridget married for a third time in 1685 to Edward Bishop, an elderly Sawyer. Here we are on the corner of Church Street and today's Washington Street. It's interesting to note that the first person tried and executed lived almost opposite the courthouse, which stood about here in the middle of Washington Street. Witchcraft accusations began in Salem Village, Danvers today, about five miles north and west of where we are, on February 29th. Bridget was accused about six weeks later on April 16th. Why was she accused? She was the perfect scapegoat. She had been accused of witchcraft years before. She was aggressive and argumentative. She may have been a petty thief because small items went missing when she was around. Workers had found poppets in her cellar. Again, those are examples of folk magic. Neighbors, the Shattuck family, accused her of bewitching their son and causing his illness. Some men claimed Bridget Spector visited them at night. She also had a bad reputation due to the volatility of her second marriage. The Olivers fought physically and verbally, sometimes in public and sometimes on the Sabbath. They were taken to court for this behavior. The punishment was a fine or standing in the public square wearing a sign. Oliver's daughter Mary paid his fine, but not her stepmother's. Bridget stood in public, humiliated. John Lauder, who worked at the Ship Tavern, which abutted Bridget's property, claimed to have an altercation with her over her chickens getting into the tavern garden, after which he saw imps in her yard and Bridget herself flying over her orchard. Bridget claimed she was innocent to the end. She was arrested on April 16th, tried on June 2nd, and hanged on June 10th. Maybe she was chosen to go first because she was the perfect target and easily convicted. As we start to cut through to Essex Street, I should mention a historical error. A long-lasting mistake in Salem Witch Trials history combined Bridget with Sarah Bishop of Salem Village. Both were described as Goody Bishop married to Edward, and if you've read that Bridget Bishop kept a tavern and allowed guests to play shovelboard until all hours of the night, well, that description is of Sarah. And of course, it was Sarah and Edward Bishop we mentioned earlier that looked after Anne Dolliver after Reverend Higginson died in 1708. In 1692, this would have been approximately where Bridget's orchards and the gardens belonging to the Ship Tavern were located. Now we're emerging onto Essex Street, which in 1692 was Main Street. Here's where the meeting house of the First Church of Salem stood in 1692. Most examinations took place in Salem Village initially, but in April, the first examination in Salem Town took place in Salem's Meeting House. Elizabeth Proctor and Sarah Cloyce were examined by the magistrates, as well as a contingent of eminent people from Boston, including Deputy Governor Thomas Danforth. Giles Corey and Rebecca Nurse were both excommunicated from this church before their deaths. Also, it was reported by Reverend Cotton Mather that when Bridget Bishop was brought from jail to the court, she glanced at the meeting house and a crash was heard inside. Later, a board was found inside quite a distance from its original location. This was claimed to be an act of witchcraft. Please note the Daniel Lowe and Company name on the building. I'll talk a little more about that shortly as we head toward the waterfront. As mentioned earlier, the successful ship tavern property abutted the bishops. The tavern was co-owned by Judge Bartholomew Gedney and his sister-in-law, Susanna Gedney, widow of Bartholomew's brother. In fact, it was often called Widow Gedney's. It was where people gathered after the trials, which took place around the corner on Townhouse Lane, also known as Court Street. The tavern provided refreshments for trial participants, ale and hard cider included. The tavern was, quote, at the head of Central Street, unquote, according to old histories, 
So about where the CVS, Essex Street Co-ops, and Red Line Cafe are today. As we walk, I'm going to talk a little more about the building we saw in the Meeting House location. The building was the home of Daniel Lowe & Company, which was a landmark Salem gift store that opened in 1874 and closed in 1995. Daniel Lowe traveled to Germany on vacation in 1890, where he saw souvenir spoons. He brought the idea back to America. Lowe created a souvenir spoon in 1891 with a witch city design, Salem's very first witch souvenir, but certainly not its last, and America's first souvenir spoon. When you visit the Salem Witch Museum, you will see four examples of original Daniel Lowe souvenir spoons in our collection. Coming up ahead is the Hawthorne Hotel on our left. This historic hotel was built in 1925. In 1692, the property was the site of John Higginson Jr.'s home. He lived quite close to his father, Reverend Higginson. You can see our museum from here. Despite his father's caution about the trials and his own sister's arrest for witchcraft, Higginson Jr. was appointed an Essex County Magistrate in June of 1692 and sat in on several witchcraft examinations, including those of three generations of accused and confessed Andover witches. They were Ann Foster, her daughter Mary Lacey, and her granddaughter Mary Lacey Jr. Speaking of Andover, more people were accused of witchcraft in Andover than in any other town. Martha Carrier was the first accused in May, but as the summer went on, more than 40 other people were accused, many of whom confessed. By that time, the accused believed the only way to save themselves from execution was to admit they were witches. To learn more about the Andover witch hunt, visit the websites of the North Andover Historical Society or of the Andover Center for History and Culture, or check out Richard Height's book, In the Shadow of Salem. As we turn left on Derby Street, we are entering what I think of as Nathaniel Hawthorne's neighborhood, as there are several locations related to him. Union Street is where Nathaniel Hawthorne was born in 1804. He only lived there a short time. His father died at sea in Suriname when Nathaniel was four. Then his mother took her three children and moved back in with her parents here on Herbert Street. In 1958, Hawthorne's birthplace was in danger of being demolished as the Catholic Church needed the property for their parking lot. The house was moved six blocks down the street to the property of the House of the Seven Gables. Novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne is Salem's most famous son. Hawthorne worked here at the Salem Custom House for three years as surveyor. This custom house was built in 1815. It was the 13th custom house built in Salem. The earlier ones were along Front Street and Central Street when the South River still came up that far. His office was on the first floor. Hawthorne is best remembered for his two novels, The Scarlet Letter from 1850 and The House of the Seven Gables from 1851. Hawthorne was the great-great-grandson of Salem witch trials judge John Hawthorne, the most aggressive and unrelenting of the questioners. His great-great-great-grandfather, William Hathorne, once had a woman whipped through the streets of Salem because she was a Quaker. The actions of his ancestors informed Hawthorne's work throughout his life. Although it is the witchcraft trials that attract a majority of visitors to Salem, it was the maritime trade that built this city. The trials lasted about one and a half years from start to finish, while the maritime trade lasted almost 150 years. At one time, there were 30 to 50 wharves along the South River. Today, there are three, including Derby Wharf in front of us. The House of the Seven Gables is where Hawthorne set his novel of the same name. It was originally built by a maritime trader, John Turner, in 1668. The Turners lived here for three generations, and then the property was sold to the Ingersolls, another maritime family. Eventually, the house and land was owned by Susanna Ingersoll, Nathaniel Hawthorne's older cousin. He visited her here, and it is said she inspired him to set his novel here. Hawthorne's writings are dark and guilt-ridden, and often deal with the sins of the fathers being visited on their descendants. In The House of the Seven Gables, Hawthorne uses a famous quote attributed to accused witch Sarah Good at her execution, when she said, I am no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take my life, God will give you blood to drink. 
A similar line is uttered by a character in the novel, a man also wrongly accused of witchcraft. Also on the property is Hawthorne's birthplace, moved from Union Street, as mentioned earlier. We highly recommend a visit to the House of the Seven Gables. You can see what they have to offer on their website, which is sevengables.org. That's the number seven, gables.org. If you walk down Turner Street toward the water, you can get a good look at the house. Bewitched fans might recognize this view, as it was featured during the Salem Saga episodes of the television show, shot on location in 1970. Now we'll head down Derby Street to the east. As we walk, I'll tell you about another Salem woman executed for witchcraft in 1692. Alice Parker lived on the waterfront. If not for her involvement in the trials, we wouldn't know anything about this woman, like many women in the 17th century. We don't know her age, her birthplace, or her maiden name. We don't know if there were any children, although it seems unlikely. We do know she was married to a fisherman named John Parker, who was away at sea a lot. It is not clear if he was at sea or deceased in 1692, as he does not appear in the records except in stories from the past. Earlier I talked about the testimony of John Westgate, who intervened when Alice tried to get her husband out of Samuel Beadle's tavern, and he said he was followed by an evil black hog later that night in retaliation. Even her minister, Reverend Nicholas Noyes, testified that he thought she was practicing witchcraft. A lot of the accusations about Alice Parker dealt with the sea. Her main accuser was John Proctor's servant, Mary Warren, who claimed Parker had bragged about sinking a ship, killing a man at sea, and drowning a boy in Salem Harbor. Like Bridget Bishop, Parker was also blamed for bewitching the same neighborhood boy, Samuel Shattuck, and causing his illness. Parker denied all charges. Alice lived in this general area, possibly behind this fence or here on Derby Street. Mary Warren, Parker's main accuser, was in 1692 a servant in the home of John and Elizabeth Proctor. She had held a grudge against Parker since childhood. She remembered Parker coming to the Warren home and asking her father for help bringing in the hay. Perhaps Alice's husband was, as usual, at sea, and for that reason she needed the help. When Goodman Warren did not come to her, Parker came back to the Warren home and had an angry altercation. Shortly thereafter, Mary Warren's mother and sister became seriously ill, perhaps with smallpox, we don't know. Her mother died, and her sister became deaf and mute. For the rest of her life, Mary Warren thought Parker had bewitched them and caused their illness. Alice Parker was arrested in May, condemned on September 9th, and hanged with seven others on September 22nd, the last hanging day. The reported comment of Reverend Nicholas Noyes, her minister, was, What a sad thing it is to see eight firebrands of hell hanging there. Where this beautiful house stands was the location of the Blue Anchor Tavern, operated by widow Eleanor Hollingsworth. Goody Hollingsworth was the mother-in-law of Philip English. He was married to her daughter Mary. She and her son William are buried in the old Bearing Point Cemetery in town. This was close to where the Marblehead Ferry came in, a perfect place for a successful tavern. Historian James Duncan Phillips described it as having, quote, a large storehouse and wharf in front of it. This was near the starting point of the Marblehead Ferry, handy to the fishing industries at Winter Island and to travelers entering the town by coastwise boats, which did not take the time to go up to the inner harbor. Eleanor, widowed in the late 1670s, had died by 1689, so did not live to see the 1692 turmoil. Her seafaring husband was declared lost at sea in 1677, leaving her with a lot of debts. Unusually for a woman of her time, she was a great businesswoman and had his debts paid off in short order, ran a successful tavern, made her own beer, and was able to leave an inheritance for her daughter when she died. We will walk up English Street now, first laid out by Philip English in the 17th century. He lived in a mansion at the top of the street. Here on the corner was the site of the magnificent mansion of Philip English, called the Great House. It had views of both Salem Harbor and Collins Cove, and his property likely covered all of this area. We heard about English earlier. He came from Jersey, he spoke French, and he had great wealth. Thanks to his international contacts, he was, in fact, the wealthiest merchant in town, with a wharf, 20 ships, and a lot of land in Salem. 
He and his wife Mary were both accused of witchcraft, jailed in Boston, and fled to New York for the duration of the trials. As we head down Essex Street back toward town, I'll tell you about the English's return to Salem after the trials were over. When English came back to town in the summer of 1693, he discovered 1,200 pounds worth of goods had been stolen. Some belongings were taken by the high sheriff, George Corwin, other belongings by his own neighbors. English sued Corwin for the return of his property. Corwin promised to return some of it, but had not by the time he died in 1696 at the age of 30. English continued to chase justice and referred to Reverend Nicholas Noyes as a murderer for the rest of his days. English died in 1735, not before donating land for the first Anglican church that we saw earlier. His heirs were eventually awarded 200 pounds in restitution after his death. The house remained standing until 1833. It is said a secret room was discovered in the attic at the time, perhaps in anticipation of further trouble in the future. Earlier, we mentioned the two Beadle brothers and their taverns. Thomas's place stood about here on Main Street, which is Essex Street today. Several examinations were held here, and some accused were even imprisoned here. Reverend George Burroughs was imprisoned in a room on the second floor and questioned here. He had been the second minister of Salem Village, which is Danvers today, from 1681 to 83. He left unhappy with the divided community and returned to Maine, where he had ministered before. As the accusation started to spread, Burroughs was named by the afflicted as the king of the witches. Many started to believe that the devil was using Burroughs to bring down the colony and the church from within. In May, he was apprehended in Wells, Maine, and brought back to Salem, and imprisoned at Beadle's Tavern. Burroughs denied all charges, but was found guilty and hanged on August 19th. Also incarcerated and questioned in the tavern were Mary Esty, sister of Rebecca Nurse and Sarah Cloyce, George Jacobs Sr. and his granddaughter Margaret Jacobs, and Anne Pudiator. We're going to cross Salem Common and head to our last stop. Salem Common was laid out when the town was first founded in the 17th century. Livestock grazed here that used to have ponds and marshes, which were eventually filled in. A fence was first put up in the 1800s. The present fence is from 1850. As we head to the site of her home, I'm going to talk about the third woman from Salem who was executed for witchcraft in 1692. She was Anne Pudiator, a 70-year-old widow who was a rather well-off midwife. We don't know a lot about her past, only that she had spent her early married life with her first husband, Thomas Greenslet, or Greenslade, in Falmouth, Maine. They had five children. Anne and Thomas relocated to Salem by the early 1670s, and shortly thereafter, Thomas died. Anne Pudiator lived on this site across the street. In the mid-1670s, she was hired by a successful blacksmith named Jacob Pudiator, to nurse his alcoholic wife through her last days. Isabel Pudiator died in 1676. Both Anne and Jacob were present when she died. Was there foul play? The two were brought to court in 1680 on murder charges, but nothing came of it. Then Anne married Jacob, who was 20 years her junior, so gossip continued to increase. Jacob died in 1682, leaving Anne a wealthy widow. The gossip grew. Anne was first accused of witchcraft in May of 1692 by Mary Warren, the proctor's servant. She was arrested, named on the same warrant as Alice Parker, and jailed. Apparently, she was initially released because she was arrested for a second time in early July. Accusations included that of neighbor Jeremiah Neal, who claimed she had bewitched his wife to death. Ointments found in her home were thought suspicious. The afflicted girls claimed her specter brought poppets to jail and encouraged them to torment others. Anne was seen flying in the shape of a bird. And did she murder her two husbands? Widow Pudiator dismissed the accusations and could not believe she could be convicted on such flimsy evidence. She was hanged on September 22nd, the last execution day of the trials, the same day as Alice Parker and six others were hanged. In the aftermath of the trials, which ended in January of 1693, 
It is interesting to note some of the odd couples that connected to each other. Anne Pudiator's son Thomas died not long after the trials. His widow Abigail married Thomas Mason in 1693. Thomas was the widower of Bridget Bishop's only child Christian. The two surely had a lot in common. That completes our tour of the Salem Witch Museum neighborhood. We hope you enjoyed it. As we head down Washington Square North to return to the museum, I want to thank you for watching. We'll be creating some new videos soon.